Don talked about God is bringing us into a place. And he referred to John chapter 14, where Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. <clears throat> it's, where, it's what that hymn is based on. I've got a mansion. Which I personally, I, I like that old hymn. I don't know. Sing it, please. And there's the one uh, <laughs> have a little cabin in the corner of Glory Land. You know, I don't I don't despise those yeah. teachings, but I don't think that's what Jesus was saying. It was what Don was saying. God wants to bring you into a place, spiritually located with Christ, in heavenly places in Christ. Because what happened when Jesus said this, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Okay, well, let's analyze that. Because in the last chapter, last verse of the last chapter is when he tells his disciples, you're all going to forsake me. And uh, Peter insists, no, I will not forsake you. And he says, no, Peter, before the cock crows, twice you're going to deny me thrice and so he was trying to draw a contrast between where he was he's saying I'm going to go lay my life down and none of you are going to stand with me and and uh, you know, imagine how you would if it could have taken somebody in one of these meetings in one of our little gatherings said that you're all done and I'm fixing to go through the trial of my life and every one of you are going to forsake me well imagine how you would take that and so in that context of what Jesus was saying I'm going to go lay my life down. Every one of you are going to forsake me. Then forget the chapter division. Just let's continue it, the conversation. But don't let your heart be troubled. He, he was telling them, I don't want, you're going to betray me, but I don't want you to let it trouble you. Wow. Why? Why would that not trouble us? He said, and the implication was in saying that if, if they were going to betray him is because they were not in Father's house. They were not right with God because, no. He, he understood what they were capable of and what they weren't capable of. He said, please don't let it bother you because he was not implying they were not in what he meant when he described Father's house because he says, in my Father's house are many mansions. There's many abiding places. Just because you can't walk where I walk and go where I'm going doesn't mean that you, you are not in a process with God. Does not mean that God rejects you. In my Father's house are many abiding places, and the abiding place where they were was not where he was. And then he goes on to say, and he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. So he's certifying, I'm not deceiving you. And then he's, he said, but understand this, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And we always say, now, first time I preached this, I had a detonation. You're not taking my mansion. You can't have my mansion. I'm gonna have my cabin in the part of glory land. You're not taking <laughs> That's right. words. <laughs> this is what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. I'm not trying to take something away from anybody. I'm not trying to take heaven away from anybody. That's that's not what the, I'm just trying to say what he's saying here. He said I go to prepare an abiding place. That's what they, you look up the original language, it means an abiding place. And didn't he teach on that in the very next chapter? Abide in me, you, mm -hmm. chapter 15, mm -hmm. what's he talking about? That's good. He said, I go to prepare a place. Where am I going? I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will come again and I will receive you to myself. Now listen to what he says. I think language is everything in the Bible. He said that where I am, right then, because what was he saying? I'm in a place mm -hmm. that I can lay my life down. You are not in the place that you can lay your life down for me. Mm -hmm. But I am in a place oh. that I can lay my life down for the Father. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to go make a preparation for you that where I am right now mm -hmm. is where you're going to be. Wow. 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 And isn't that what he went on to say to Peter later on? Amen. And he prophesied that Peter was going to be crucified? Yeah. Jesus. That where I am, you may be also. And then he goes on and he has a further conversation. But that's, he's preparing. See, Jesus is the high priest and apostle of our profession. That's right. 
And and as what to me, it's not the only thing an apostle does, but to me, an apostle, a big part of being an apostle is one who establishes the paternity of God in your life. That's why Jesus kept saying, Father, 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 Father. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been saying Father my whole life, and now we send the prophetic word out to thousands. And I can't tell you, I regularly get emails where I get grilled. Who is this Father oh, you're oh talking? My. Who is this? <laughs> Are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? Oh, my you know, God. And yeah. they start questioning my orthodoxy because... Uh, they don't have that understanding of all understand. It's literally the Abba Father thing, yeah. you know, Daddy God. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't get that. There's this major disconnect. That's God, not the yeah. God yeah. of the mm -hmm. religious culture that they're a part of. It's alien oh, to them. That's sad. Mm -hmm. And Jesus came, I and my Father are one. I that's only do what I see my Father do. Preacher said, you didn't hear, not everybody can hear. Well, that. as a kid, when I was a kid, from about age of seven, I heard the audible voice of God. Of course, I found out later on when I was pastoring my second church, there were friends of people who attended my church that when the charismatic move came through the Catholic church in that area, a lot of the people who got baptized in the Holy Ghost and started hearing God were put away because hearing the voice of God is a symptom of schizophrenia. Yeah. And there are people this day oh, yeah. that have been committed for life because the charismatic movement came through and revolutionized their life. They began to hear the voice of God. Well, I heard the audible voice of God from the time I was seven till the time I was <laughs> eight. And I heard his voice. And then, uh, then one day, as, as just a kid, going through teenage rebellion and all that, I said, okay, I'm going to leave now. He said, you'll regret it said, but I'll be here when you get back. Mm -hmm. And I went through a very misspent childhood and teenage years and came back to God, and there's a whole testimony behind that. But it was very second nature for me. I was pastoring. I was attending for seven years. I attended a independent, non-denominational pastor's lunch, monthly pastor's lunch in Alexandria, Louisiana. And occasionally I'd be asked to speak, and the man who ran it was a good friend of mine. So, and it was pastors from all over the city, very powerful men, big congregations of which I was not pastoring a big congregation at the time. And I was sharing my little word, what I had to share. And I would make an offhand remark. And the Lord told me the other day, and one of the most prominent pastors in that city interrupted me. He said, that's what I, that's the problem I have with you. God doesn't talk to people like that. He doesn't talk to me like that. <laughs> And I don't believe he talks to you like that. And there's this murmur of approval that runs through this crowd of pastors and their wives. And normally, I'm the kind of person, I, I don't handle that kind of confrontation very well. And I, I'll think about it later, what I might have said. And this is one of those rare times where it's like I opened my mouth and I looked at this crowd of pastors. And I was just a pastor of a little country church. I said, you mean to tell me you're not on speaking terms with your father? You mean to tell me that it is the norm not to hear the voice of God and anybody who claims to hear the voice of God is considered extreme mm -hmm. and unsafe? Is that what you're saying to me? And it just silenced them. Mm -hmm. Whether they agreed with me or not, it, it put them to silence about the voice. See, for me, all of my life, I was very fortunate that my natural father was also my spiritual father. Mm -hmm. And all of my life, I heard God speak to me in the voice of Roy Walden. I had an open vision of the cross when I was 12. And the Lord said, for the next 12 years, I'm going to reveal the cross. And in 12 years, there's going to come another vision, and then I'm going to reveal to you the throne for the next 12 years after that, which I think would have put me at 34. And so from the time I was 24 to 34, I always heard God speak to me in my father's voice. But on my 34th birthday, 
I went outside. I remember where I was at, what I was doing. Went outside, my backyard, it's August, because my birthday's in August. And God starts talking to me, and all of a sudden, I don't recognize his voice. He's not talking to me in the vernacular and the voice of Roy Walden. And I'm like, okay, something changed, and I don't know what it is. Would you explain it to me? He said, I will no longer speak to you in the voice of your natural father. I will speak to you in my native voice. He said, in fact, that's what all fathers are supposed to do with their children. Fathers are called by God to be the voice of God to their children, to mentor them in the voice of God until they can hear God for themselves. I said, well, what does that mean? It means today, he said, you become an adult. You do not become a spiritual adult until you hear the voice of God in his native voice that is not being filtered through the apostolic father that God placed in your life and hopefully you were able to identify and relate to. And uh, powerful understanding. And it was something that was just so presumptive for me because I thought it was just psychology that God's talking to me and he's going to sound like Roy Walden. Say stuff to me when I was a kid, my daddy would get his take off that little thin belt he'd wear it because I needed a spanking. And I'd, I'd take off running out the back pasture behind our house. Yeah. He'd chuckle. He'd chuckle. He'd say, don't you run from me, boy. You'll come back when you get hungry. <laughs> and those were the kind of things God would tell me, you know. Dealing with God, growing up as a young man, pastoring the church. You know, don't you run from me, boy. You'll come back when you get hungry. <laughs> Apostolic fathers, an abiding place. Now, wait a minute, one last thing, and go a little bit deeper. That where I am, there you may be also. Where was he? Okay, whoever he is, whatever he was at that moment, he was inside of a physical body. He said, I, my father is a spirit. I and my father are one. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, when he said we must worship him in spirit, he was not talking about the Holy Spirit. He was talking about the human spirit. Mm -hmm. How many of you ever heard soulish worship? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, that where I am, there you may be also. Well, you have to know where he was in order to get that. Where is the seat of your consciousness? We say the soul... We have a body. Aboriginal tribes, their seat of consciousness, anthropologists can tell you by studying Aboriginal tribes, they have no sense of soul or spirit. Uh, their, the seat of their consciousness is wrapped up in their physical being. They don't have any understanding beyond that. Unless they get exposed to Western ideas. The soul, it is said, is made up of mind, will, and emotion. And we have a doctrine that says, I am a spirit, but if you listen to people, they make statements like, I think, I will, I feel. Mind, will, and emotions. James Brown had it right. I'm a soul man. <laughs> and most of us are a soul man. There's a book by Watchman Nee I'd recommend you to get called The Latent Power of the Soul. And it gives some understanding about that. And, but for Jesus, Jesus' sense of self-referral was not anchored in his soul. He never said, I think, I feel, I, I, I think, I feel, I will. Mm -hmm. What he did say was, now is my soul troubled exceedingly nigh even unto death. In other words, he referred to his soul in the third person. And again, I'm answering the question that where I am, you may be also. That his consciousness, his self-awareness, who he was. See, when, when David said in Psalm 51, I was born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Mm -hmm. When you study the language, it means he was shut out of what? The holy of holies on the inside of him. When Paul talked about the middle wall of partition, it's the, and you're the temple of God, he's talking about a partition on the inside of you where your identity, your consciousness was shut out of your spirit where God intended to live. And Jesus breached that barrier because it didn't exist because he was sinless. And so he 
in his native state, being sinless, was automatically one with God, and mm -hmm. I'm going to prepare a place to take away the middle wall of partition mm -hmm. so that your consciousness, the seat of who you are, can move out of your soul into your spirit, and you're walking around wrapped up in your soul and your body, but you are one with God. As And he prayed in John 17. He said, Father, I pray that they would be one that with each other, which is the opposite way theology would teach that. We think we got to get right with God so we can get right with one another. Jesus' great intercessory prayer was exactly the opposite. He said, Father, I pray that they would be one with each other. So something about doing this is part of God's process. Becoming one with one another is part of God's process of getting us to the place of being one with him. Amen. It's the exact opposite the way it'll get to, it gets taught to but he said, I pray that they would be one even as we are one. And the oneness of the Father with the Son is so inscrutable, uh, wars have been fought. Nations have risen and fallen over the understanding of the distinction between Father and Son. And he said, Father, I pray. Do Jesus' prayers get answered? Yep. Mm -hmm. I pray that you, they would be one with us even as we are one with each other. Where it would not be presumption for us to say, for you to turn and say to someone, Have I long, been so long with you that you haven't known me? Mm -hmm. Philip? Mm -hmm. Because you are, uh, the first time I ever did a radio broadcast, I called it At One with the Father. Mm -hmm. See, that's the place he went to prepare. Mm -hmm. That's where the sending. And the going proceed from. That's where everything you say and do becomes as effective as if he said it or did it. If you can, if you can even, even if you haven't grown to that part, if you could just get a hold of that ticker tape of information that's coming out of your spirit where God lives, and if you could read that and act on it, mm -hmm. I only won't do what I see the Father do. And you just go do that. Even if you're a very soulish believer, that's why people that have massive anointings and no maturity can go out and work miracles. Because they've managed to figure out how to get a hold of that ticker tape of the mind of the Father that's coming out of them. Oh, do this. Okay, let's go do that. And it works. See, But he wants us to have a whole lot more than just a text message from the heaven that's on the inside of you. And I'll finish with this. Luke 17, when he said, the kingdom of God is within you, what the Lord told me was this. Now, I didn't talk about this for a long time. I, I used to explain it like this. I said, uh, whatever the kingdom is, it's on the inside of you. What the Lord told me was, the kingdom that's not inside you is not the kingdom. Remember Paul talked about another Jesus? Mm -hmm. Outward dependency, outward infrastructure. Mm -hmm. See, what do we teach to keep church people in line? Outward dependency, you need to be here every time the doors are open. You mm -hmm. need the church. And I'm not saying we don't need each other. Mm -hmm. But Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in me is not your hope of glory. Christ in you is your papa. Christ in me is just your brother. You need to love your brother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you obey your papa. Amen. Oh, that's dangerous, brother. You better believe it. It's dangerous to the devil. And it's dangerous to others as well. Because remember what Peter said? Peter complained about Paul's teaching. He said the people, the ignorant, the unlearned, are taking Paul's teachings and they're wrestling Paul's teachings to their own destruction. He complained. He would not have been buying anything off of Paul's tape table. <laughs> and the Lord said, Exactly. The revelation that came through Paul was so important to God that he was willing to write off the ignorant on one hand and the unlearned on the other in order to empower everybody else. And you better believe it's dangerous. But do you want to be, get treated like a child in a playpen or do you want to get treated like a spiritual adult? We're making adult promises to children we're trying to keep in the playpen of Christian religion. That's what the Pharisees did. They made rules around God's rules so you didn't break his rules because you're not spiritual enough to understand this. Well, that's not how I approach these things. You've got to get the real deal. 
to deposit, to, to treat the real substance of truth on the inside of you and let it take you where it may, even if it means you outgrow me. You probably already have. <laughs> if I think you haven't, you probably already have. Because <laughs> true papas, think about your kids. You want your kids, would you get offended if your kids uh, are more prosperous than you are? I want my kids to be more prosperous than I am. I want them to stand on that's the heart of a mama and a papa. Yeah. 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 Well, you're going to keep them down? You know? Hard. You have to do everything you can to promote them and rejoice when they yeah. when they exceed you. My dad, I have fulfilled my father's lifelong vision and gone way beyond it. He rejoices. He totally rejoices. It just delights him to see it because of the heart of a papa. That's right.